Good morning, and welcome to the public hearing of the Commission on Judicial Appointments. As Chief Justice of California, I serve as chair of the commission, and our members are Attorney General Javier Becerra and Presiding Justice J. Anthony Klein. Amoy Kim and Charlie Cahoon serve as secretaries to the commission. This hearing is to consider Governor Gavin Newsom's appointment of Judge Terry L. Jackson to the Office of Associate Justice, Court of Appeal, First Appellate District, Division Three. We are in receipt of a letter from Governor Newsom appointing Judge Jackson to fill a vacancy created by the retirement from the bench of Justice Martin J. Jenkins, who is here. Good morning, Justice Jenkins. The state constitution specifies that an appointment by the governor to the Court of Appeal is effective when confirmed by the Commission on Judicial Appointments. We received correspondence pertaining to this appointment and made these letters available to the press and to the public a few days ago. Pursuant to a request by Governor Newsom, the State Bar's Commission on Judicial Nominees Evaluation has undertaken an evaluation of the qualifications of Judge Jackson, and we have Ms. Diane A. Bellis, Chair, of the Jenny Commission. She's present today and will later publicly announce the results of that evaluation. Judge Jackson has asked the following persons to be called to testify at the podium as to her qualifications. I'm going to list your names now and call you up separately to the podium. We have the Honorable Kelvin D. Filer, Judge of the Superior Court of Los Angeles County. The Honorable Cynthia Ming May Lee, of the Superior Court of San Francisco County. The Honorable Rebecca Wiseman, retired justice of the Fifth District Court of Appeal. And Ms. Yolanda Jackson, executive director and general counsel of the Bar Association of San Francisco. I welcome Judge Filer to the podium. Race ipsa loquitur. <laughs> As a sitting judge, I missed the opportunity to be able to give closing arguments to a jury to show the interaction between the law and the evidence to arrive at the facts. If I could still provide that message, I would say, race ipsa loquitur. Now, you are the sole judges of the evidence and the believability of the witnesses. In deciding whether testimony is true and correct, use your common sense and experience. Direct evidence, which you are now receiving, is evidence that can prove a fact by itself. During this process, several items were received into evidence as exhibits, reflecting Terry L. Jackson's intelligence, patience, and work ethic. You may examine whatever exhibits you think will help in your deliberations. In reaching your decision, you may consider whether the nominee had a motive. Terry Jackson's lifelong motive to excel and achieve principles that were instilled in her at an early age by her loving parents have enabled her to get a BA degree from UC Santa Cruz and her JD degree from Georgetown University Law School. She subsequently fought for justice in our criminal courts as a deputy district attorney in two separate counties. She proceeded to advocate for her clients in the arena of complex civil litigation, and she reached back to help others by becoming a law professor at UC Hastings School of Law. Having these motives may be a factor tended to show that the nominee is deserving of confirmation. You have heard and received eyewitness testimony identifying the nominee as a recipient of numerous community and civic awards as the first African-American woman to serve on the San Francisco Superior Court. And if confirmed, she will be the first African-American woman to serve on the San Francisco Appellate Court. Now in evaluating an eyewitness identification testimony, you should consider the following questions. Did the witness know or have contact with the nominee before the event? Yes, I met her in 1973 at UC Santa Cruz. <laughs> Did the witnesses give a description of an outstanding jurist and does that description fit the nominee? Yes, Judge Jackson exemplifies patience, integrity, and intelligence. Did any witness ever fail to identify the nominee as an outstanding candidate? No. Did any witness ever change their mind about the identification? No. How certain were the witnesses when they made their identifications? Absolutely 100% <coughs> certain. 
You have heard character testimony that Taylor Jackson has a good reputation for giving back to the community, working with local bar associations, participating in mentor groups, and supporting a variety of community charitable organizations. Evidence of a nominee's good character can by itself eliminate any doubt whether the nominee should be confirmed. You have heard evidence that the nominee has made numerous oral presentations and written statements. In her speaking engagements, she is eloquent, organized, and especially adept in presenting her message to our audience. Plus, she has already written numerous legal decisions in her three-year judicial assignment on the appellate panel. Now, you must not be biased against the nominee because she is humble, <laughs> loves her family, and does not know how to tell a joke. <laughs> the law is clear that proof beyond a reasonable doubt is proof that leaves you with an abiding conviction that the charge is true. If I were still able to give a closing argument, I would say to this confirmation jury that the evidence establishes beyond any and all reasonable doubt that my friend, Terry Leatrice Jackson, is deserving of confirmation. Race ipsa locator. Thank you, Judge Filer. I welcome next the Honorable Cynthia Ming May Lee to the podium. Good morning, Chief Justice Kantil Sakiyui, Presiding Justice Klein, Attorney General Becerra. I've known the Honorable Terry L. Jackson for over 35 years. We worked together in the San Francisco District Attorney's Office where I had an opportunity to observe her vigorous advocacy, her exceptional trial skills, as well as her commitment, to quote Spike Lee, to do the right thing. She was a courageous trailblazer in the prosecution of domestic violence and elder abuse cases. To my enormous delight, Judge Jackson joined me as a colleague on the San Francisco Superior Court bench in 2002 where she has always been the consummate colleague. She's collegial, hardworking, intellectually inquisitive, and dedicated to the law. Her laughter, humor, I, I beg to differ with, Chief, Chief, with just uh, Judge Flyer. She, she does tell a joke, not always the funniest, but still pretty good. <laughs> still pretty good. You'll see. She has a great humility, and her self-deprecating style has filled the hallways of our court with infectious positivity. She spreads a net of inclusivity that is impossible to escape. I know she will bring these same attributes to the first district. As presiding judge in 2013 and 2014, I assigned Judge Jackson to the Asbestos and CEQA Department where part of her charge was to bring plaintiff and defense bars in to collaborate on new local rules for asbestos cases. Over a period of many months and very long give and takes, Judge Jackson was able to build consensus. She brought to the table the ability to listen to both sides, respect their relative interests, and craft a set of local rules that work for everybody. I'd like to read a response to a question which I answered last year while running in a contested judicial election. The question, which judge among those currently on the San Francisco bench do you most respect? My response, in this time of decreased in court funding, challenges to judges on her bench and other pressing issues, so Jackson has demonstrated leadership and integrity in all matters. She embraces all challenges which come with leading a court under stress and has done so with humor and patience. Judge Jackson has communication skills which enable her to unify and yet not lose sight of the differences in opinion. She's a true leader for our times. She is not only the first African American female presiding judge of our court, but is also one of the strongest proponents for an independent judiciary in the history of our court. To put it simply, she is an extraordinary asset to our bench. The profound loss of the Honorable Terry L. Jackson to the San Francisco Superior Court is, without question, the incredible gain to the First District Court of Appeals. Thank you.
Thank you, Judge Lee. Next, we welcome the Honorable Rebecca Weissman to the podium. Right. Good morning, Chief Justice Cantil Sakaui. It's so nice to see you. And Justice Presiding, uh, uh, Presiding Justice Klein and Attorney General Becerra. What a pleasure. And I join in the comments of everyone that has spoken before me. Um, what acts to follow. Um, having um, and trying to be mindful of time, what I intend to speak about is what why Judge Jackson possesses all of the qualities that make her a standout candidate for the Court of Appeal. Having sat on the Court of Appeal for a few years myself, um, I have gleaned that there are four traits that really will enable you to look at and predict who will be an outstanding Court of Appeal justice. And these traits include possessing intelligence and maybe even just as important, having a curious legal mind, which she certainly does. Two, being a good listener. Three, having the ability to keep an open mind and not to have any legal agenda. And four, treating your peers, your staff, and those appearing before you with genuine respect. Now, Judge Jackson has all of these qualities. Now, how do I know that? Because I read the record, and that's something that appellate justices are very prone to do. First of all, Judge Jackson has, without any, in, any doubt, the great intelligence that's required, and she definitely has a curious legal mind. Her strong and varied background, legal-wise, speaks for itself. As a member of the San Francisco Superior Court, she has served with distinction in assignments that I would describe as legally complex, but also those assignments that are complex for other reasons. And we probably all know what type of assignments those are. By doing so, she's earned the confidence of her colleagues, leading them to trust her with the administration of that court during very complicated political and economic times. And for goodness sake, she teaches law school, not at one law school, but at two law schools, two very fine institutions, the University of San Francisco and UC Hastings. And I can say from personal experience, she's been an outstanding instructor for the Rudder Group because we have conscripted her to uh, speak often on civil law and on employment law issues for uh, attorneys that are learning the practice and those that maybe aren't so young but are trying to learn the civil practice. And she always makes everything clear. And I think all of you understand how important that trait is for someone on the Court of Appeal. Second, Judge Jackson is a very good listener. One need only have a conversation with her, and you know this is true. I first learned this when I was fortunate enough to have an assignment at the San Francisco Superior Court for a lengthy period of time. And uh, Judge Ann Bullion and I would often gather with Judge Jackson. We would talk about everything from soup to nuts. I don't want to say we gossiped, we didn't. But we talked about everything. And that is when I first learned that when you're talking to Judge Jackson, you are the only one in the room she does not interrupt, she does not try to direct the conversation, and she often injects insight through her signature good sense of humor. And I can tell you that'll go a long ways with any colleagues, uh, those traits. Uh, third, Judge Jackson has an open mind and she has no legal agenda whatsoever. She is one of those judges where counsel can walk confidently into a courtroom and tell his or her client that they have a chance. And that that is so important because with Judge Jackson, there is never an agenda where she has her mind made up in advance. And finally, Judge Jackson knows the importance of treating others with genuine respect, including colleagues, importantly staff, as well as litigants. Now, as this panel knows, having a successful relationship with colleagues and staff, that's no accident, right? It doesn't happen by accident. It happens through hard work. And I sp suspect that's also true in the Attorney General's office as well, although I've never had the privilege of working there. I know many people that have, and I have deep respect for them. 
it requires emotional intelligence as well as legal intelligence. And I believe this is at least in part why the, in the face of a contested mm. election between two other candidates, the judges of the San Francisco Superior Court chose, instead of going through that, to elect Judge Jackson as the presiding judge because they knew she was the right person for a very, very difficult job. Lastly, and I hope you'll bear with me on this. I know from personal experience how special Division Three of the First District Court of Appeal is, having had the privilege of sitting there on assignment. Each justice brings his or her unique talents to the table, and Judge Jackson will only add to this exceptional mix of judicial talent. I recommend her in the strongest possible terms for confirmation to the First District Court of Appeal, Division Three, and thank you for listening. Thank you, Justice Wiseman. Next, we invite to the podium Ms. Yolanda Jackson. <clears throat> Good morning, Your Honors. Morning. The full commission of the judicial appointments, on commission on judicial appointments. Thank you for allowing me to speak on behalf of the Honorable Terry Jackson to support her confirmation to the Court of Appeal. <clears throat> Terry is a friend of mine. We've known each other for over 24 years. In fact, Judge Jackson was, the one, was one of the attorneys who spoke to my class of bar passers at the Oakland Convention Center in December 1995. That was my first time meeting her, and I cannot tell you how it felt as an African-American woman to have an African-American female attorney address and inspire me along with hundreds of my fellow soon-to-be admittees on that day. I have forever since been impressed with, with and proud of Judge Jackson. There are many attributes by which a judge is vetted and selected to serve. Judge Jackson ranks very well on most, if not all, of those attributes. However, today, I want to share with the commission those attributes which I believe set her apart from other judicial candidates who have been vetted and some who have been selected. She, without question, has integrity, intellectual capacity, good judgment, decisiveness, and professional experience. What is more difficult to find in judicial candidates are the attributes of being able to transcend personal biases, having a general and good reputation in the community, and remaining engaged in community and uh, public service. Judge Jackson excels both naturally and intentionally in these latter categories. Here are just a few examples of how and where. Judge Jackson has dedicated many years on the bench to helping young lawyers gain confidence, experience, and advocacy skills as they grow as attorneys. She's held numerous training sessions with newer lawyers through the Barristers Club of the Bar Association of San Francisco, in fact, the Barristers honored Judge Jackson with, her, with their 2018 Barristers' Choice Award for her strong support of the development of these lawyers. Judge Jackson often tells people that the attorneys are the most important and powerful people in the courtroom because they are there to advocate. It is her passion to train newer lawyers on how to be the best advocates they can. As you've heard, Judge Jackson has dedicated much of her spare time to teaching law school students Again, because she has something to give to the law students who will one day be charged with being strong legal, legal advocates for their clients. While she was the presiding judge of the San Francisco Superior Court in 2017 and 2018, Judge Jackson spearheaded with BASF hosting th at least three community meetings called Meet the Judges, so the judges could go into various communities in San Francisco and learn more about the communities that they serve and so that communities could learn more about the San Francisco Superior Court and the important role that the judiciary plays in our government. Finally, and my personal favorite, Judge Jackson has demonstrated that she can transcend personal biases in her work on this. This may have all started when she was a little girl in Daly City, where she personally was the first black child to integrate her elementary school. Or maybe it was when her family was repeatedly threatened by their neighbors because they were the first black family to move into the neighborhood. These experiences force you to understand, to get along with others who do not look like you or share your background. 
You learn to listen to others. You learn to understand others. And in some strange way, you learn to trust others through that experience. Today, that is who Terry is. Someone who is comfortable listening, understanding, treating people fairly, and at first blush, recognizing how to be fair to people who have nothing in common with her. She frequently speaks on panels on the topic of transcending, transcending biases in the legal profession, and she has regularly proven in her career that she treats everyone from the representative of the corporate giant in a civil courtroom to the indigent client in the criminal courtroom equally and the same. That is with respect, with care, with a listening ear, and with fairness. I strongly encourage this commission to confirm Governor Newsom's appointment of the Honorable Terry Jackson to the Court of Appeal. Thank you, Ms. Jackson. Next, I invite the Jenny Chair, Diane Bellis, to the podium. Good morning, Chief Justice Kantil Sakauye, Presiding Justice Klein, and Attorney General Becerra. I'm honored to present this report on behalf of the Commission on Judicial Nominees Evaluation to summarize the basis for the Jenny Commission's rating of the Honorable Terry Leatrice Jackson to the Office of Associate Justice Division III of the First District Court of Appeal. The Jenny Commission conducted its evaluation of Judge Jackson on August 17, 2019, finding her to be exceptionally well qualified for service on the appellate court. According to commission rules, the rating reflects the commission's determination that Judge Jackson possesses qualities and attributes of remarkable or extraordinary superiority that enable her to perform the appellate judicial function with distinction. A bright spark ignited in Judge Jackson when, as a child, Judge Jackson's father drove her to courthouses throughout Northern California to meet and observe prominent African-American jurists. That bright spark became a brilliant fire as Judge Jackson earned her BA degree in politics from UC Santa Cruz and her JD degree from Georgetown University. She was thereafter exposed to civil litigation practice worked for several years for the San Mateo County District Attorney's Office, and then joined the newly created San Francisco County District Attorney's Domestic Violence Prosecution Unit. There, she blazed trails as one of California's leading experts on the prosecution of domestic violence offenses, obtaining the state's first felony jury trial conviction for elder abuse, and becoming the first woman and African American to lead the office's homicide unit. In 1997, Judge Jackson joined Oric, Harrington, and Sutcliffe as of counsel, specializing in complex litigation, employment defense, trade secrets, and white collar defense. And now, as the first African American woman appointed to the San Francisco County Superior Court in 2002, Judge Jackson brings before you a record of achievement reflecting broad and deep criminal and civil trial experience, as well as experience gained as supervising judge of the Asbestos Sequa Department, supervising judge of the Criminal Division, assistant presiding judge, and presiding judge. With that come appellate skills honed in the Superior Court's Appellate Department <coughs> and in the course of authoring over 50 opinions. Judge Jackson has seized every opportunity to move institutions and their systems forward. As supervising judge, she implemented case management orders now used throughout the state. At the request of former Chief Justice Ronald George, she served for five months on the Riverside County Criminal Backlog Reduction Task Force. Through her service on the Judicial Council's Criminal Jury Instructions Advisory Committee, she helped review, draft, and edit all criminal jury instructions. As Chief Justice George's appointee to the Pretrial Detention Reform Workgroup, her work advanced major reforms recently passed into law. But it is equally significant that Judge Jackson has also seized opportunities to move individuals themselves forward. 
For 15 years, she has taught criminal trial advocacy and evidence to law students at University of California Hastings College of the Law and University of San Francisco School of Law. She has answered repeated calls to teach her judicial colleagues and has lectured before the California Judges Association, the Judicial Council's New Judges Orientation, and the Judicial Council's Presiding Judges Institute. And she has made time in the midst of all other duties and responsibilities for active participation in numerous community organizations that focus on mentoring at-risk youth and African-American women. Her door has been open on Friday afternoons for students who wish to meet her in chambers and visit. And when these young people come to visit, they find themselves in the presence of the person described by Jenny Commission Raiders, a highly accomplished jurist with strong interpersonal skills praised by colleagues for her intelligence, collegiality, leadership ability, legal knowledge, and work ethic a person who has rigorously dedicated herself to justice and whose fire continues to burn brightly. On a personal note, my father, Anthony J. Bellis, taught me from the time I was a very young girl that I should always listen for the truth on fire and that I would know it when I hear it. And I believe we've all heard it here this morning. Thank you for this opportunity to address you. I will be pleased to respond to any questions you may have. Thank you, Chairperson Bellis. Thank you. I now invite Judge Jackson to the podium to present a statement, if you wish, answer, and to answer any questions the commission may have. Good morning. Good morning. It is such an honor. Chief Justice, Justice Klein, and of course our Attorney General, I want to thank the governor for placing my name in nomination for the vacancy in the third district or third division of the Court of Appeals for the appellate um, district, first appellate district. Forgive me. I know everyone's saying I can communicate and I can talk right now. This is the nervous I've ever been. <laughs> All right, this is Terry. <laughs> Judges are not used to being on that side of the bench. I bush. know. <laughs> I love it when it's the other way around. Needless to say, I'm overwhelmed by the speakers, my friends, and all of my family who's here. It is truly an honor to be here and to have the opportunity to answer any questions that any of you may have of me. Any questions? Well, I, I don't have any questions, but I have something to say that you might treat as a question if you wish. Um, unlike the other two members of this commission, I'm here only because I refuse to go away. <laughs> I'm the oldest presiding uh, justice of the Court of Appeal in the state. Um, and one of the virtues of getting old, I've learned, is that you can get away with a lot, or more than I used to be able to get away with. And so I say that because I want to bring up a subject that rarely uh, arises uh, at events like this, which is politics. Um, if one looks around the United States today at the predicament of state courts, you see that they are being rapidly politicized. This used to be confined to a small number of southern states. It's now the case all over the country. The California judicial system is the biggest judicial system in the world. Nobody, not the President of the United States or anybody, appoints more judges than the governor of this state. Uh, and we have, I believe, and have had for decades, the most outstanding uh, judiciary in the country. Our judiciary is not now, in, in my opinion, in danger of being politicized, as is happening in Wisconsin, in Pennsylvania, in Iowa, in many southern states, in a growing number of states. But it can happen. Now, you're the last person I have to give a speech to uh, about judicial independence. I've known you uh, for a long time, uh, not as well as I would 
like to know you and expect to, uh, to know you. But the one event uh, in your life that has impressed me the most is your audacity in defending uh, the four <clears throat> judges uh, on your court who were challenged, uh, not because of their quality as human beings or their character as judges, but because the governor that appointed them was a Republican. Um, so you are, don't need to be told about the problem. Now, I, I believe there is a risk that what is happening uh, in, inc in increasing ways uh, in the rest of this country can happen here. We blind ourselves if we think otherwise. What happened uh, here in San Francisco, and this wasn't the first time, uh, is starting to happen elsewhere. Uh, now, when you come to this court, you can't be challenged, but you can be defeated, as members of our Supreme Court have been for reasons that were po purely political. Um, now, why am I bringing this all up here? You're about to become the junior member of this court. I'm the, referred to by my colleagues as the dean of the court only because I've been here longer. Uh, and I love to be uh, flattered that way, I must say. You're gonna be the junior judge. And you are not, I don't think, a presumptuous person. And so you may feel, maybe I'd like to hear you on this subject, you may feel it would be presumptuous of you uh, to become a leader on a subject as serious and profound as the integrity of our judicial system, the independence of our courts. I hope you don't. I don't think you will. Um, you know, a mutual friend of ours who knows your family uh, I had lunch with him recently, and he described your mother as a firebrand. And then he said, she's in that image. And I think he's right. That uh, He's in the courtroom, that person. And I think you probably know who it was. Um, but I'm hoping he's right. I expect you to continue to be the audacious, effective, articulate defender of judicial independence. We can't leave that task only to our Chief Justice. She needs help. Uh, you know, when, when I was in state government and uh, Willie Brown, who's here today, was the speaker, the legislature was dominated by lawyers like Willie Brown, who respected the independence of the judiciary. That is no longer the case. Uh, members of the legislature now are willing to treat the judicial system like the Department of Motor Vehicles. They're willing to give us uh, the support that we need, but only if we can do something for them. This has actually happened. I'm not imagining this. So I'm glad that you're a friend of Willie Brown, that he's taken the time to come here. Uh, there's not many judges who would be comfortable consulting a political figure like that, but I don't think you'll have any problem. <laughs> Now, that, that wasn't a question. Uh, <laughs> too fast, but if you care to, to make a well, statement, I would. If I can respond here. first to your being the most senior person and you are um, not willing to leave, I don't believe one should leave, one should pass the torch. I believe one should light others, to other people's torches so you have a light. So just light my torch and I'll be there with you, okay? <laughs> As to leadership, leadership comes in many forms. I did not seek to be the leader. I only sought to be an advocate or a person when there was a wrong or there was something that needed to be taken care of and repaired or tweaked, that I would be a part of it. You know, it's so interesting. My confirmation hearing is the day after the Martin Luther King birthday, our celebration. And Dr. King said, you know, some of us will be drum majors for justice. Some of us will be band leaders for justice. Some of us will be the cheerleaders. But the bottom line is you have to seek justice, um, right the wrongs. And judicial independence rights the wrong and is very important to us. And I'm glad that our, our, our judiciary is committed to judicial independence, and I will continue to be there. So if you're asking if I will, because I'm a junior <clears throat> member, 
will I sit back and not know when called upon as the Chief Justice? And just one little correction, I really appreciate Jenny, but it was the Chief Justice who appointed me to the pretrial pre, um, detention reform. And that insight, I was so proud to be a part of it. We may disagree about how bail reform should take place, but the bottom line is I'm gonna be there to advocate, to look, reevaluate. So no, I'm not a quiet person. <laughs> but I also will be a person who will participate, be it the drum major, the cheerleader, or the band. First of all, I may say, I um, congratulate you on all you've done so far. And it is refreshing on this day, having spent 24 years of my professional life in Washington, D.C., to be here today to cast this vote than worry about what the folks in D.C. are going to have to do in casting their vote fairly soon. Um, mm -hmm. What a difference. It is a tale of two cities to be here in California and San Francisco to have the honor to vote on bringing someone who is eminently qualified into our appellate system versus have to worry about the democratic institutions of this country working in Washington, D.C. And so I will tell you that uh, I applaud you for what you do, but I think it's also a sign of what we do in California uh, that we're here. I have two questions, and one is more difficult, I think, than the other. I'll give you the easy one first. Um, my suspicion is that you had the title of first with you for quite some time, first in doing this, first in doing that. Sometimes it can get a little frustrating, frustrating being only, only one and the first. Uh, you often wonder why it took so long. Uh, and so I guess my first question to you would be, as the first African-American woman who will sit on this first appellate district court, you have any first that you'd like to break or maybe a last you'd like to get rid of? <laughs> well, the last I'd like to get rid of, that I would be the only one sitting there. So, but it, not just the fact that I'm the first African-American woman, I wanted to be understood, it's about qualifications. So we can strive to be the first, but there are so many qualified. As I went through my interview with Jenny, I often said, it's not that I'm the most but I'm just as qualified, and there are many more who are sitting in this room that are as qualified. So I will not be the last. And the reason why I'm the first is because of Mayor Brown, who advocated and looked and tried to promote many of us when I was a young woman, just starting to practice law. And I, when I was walking down the hallways, I saw Justice Clinton White, the presiding justice of the Third Division, how often he would meet with us. And I'm looking at Chloe Hewlett and uh, the late Pat Ector and the Judy Johnson, who was Judge Judy Johnson, but she was also the, the executive director of the state bar. And he would mentor us back in, oh, dare I say it, 1980s, about this should not be the end. So with the first comes many responsibilities and burdens, but it's the responsibility to make sure others have that opportunity as well. And, and um... I noticed that along with my former speaker, uh, Mayor now and former Mayor Brown, that you have a number of folks who have achieved a great deal. I see uh, Chief, uh, our Chief is back there. Chief uh, Scott has had an opportunity to be a first in so many different respects. I am pleased that he is here as well with so many other folks. Uh, my second question, and I, I hope you're willing to answer it, but you may, you may decide to defer and I'll let you do that as well. Okay. Um, Judge Filer pointed out some important things about you. Um, are you prepared to give us your best joke? <laughs> I don't have them. He's right. I, I, I can't tell a joke. I can't remember it. I can't do the punchline. And when I do it, it falls flat. So he really does remember me very, very well. <laughs> My vote may not be in the balance on this one, but I thought I would, I thought I would at least ask. You know, um, my nephews, I, you know, I try to be an expert on everything, but the, trust, trust me, no. I can't tell a joke. I really don't know what boxing out means in NBA. I don't know those things, so don't. Okay. Thank you. 
So I have two observations and a question. Okay. And the first observation is, in the judiciary, thank goodness, what we're governed by is rule of law, not politics. So it might be interesting, but it's not the bread and butter of what we do for litigants in front of our court. And so I appreciate your vast range of experience to know the difference and the real duty of a jurist who takes the oath to uphold both constitutions. And the second observation I would make is, junior justice or not, your vote is, for, is equal to everyone else's. So the beauty of that is looking forward to your contributions that you will make. My question is, reading about your family and reading about your experiences and then knowing you on the Judicial Council, knowing you as a task force member, knowing you as a professor of judges in terms of our NJO, seeing you on your way before heading off to teach as an adjunct. My question for you really is, how do you see the future of the judiciary forming? In San Francisco and throughout our other 57 counties as well as on our, our appellate level, I see it a future. And fortunately for me, because I'm in a law school classroom where I started teaching back in, I guess, the late 80s, early 90s, where my law school classes were predominantly men, and they were Caucasian, and there were very smatterings of women. Now my classes are 80% women of, of, of color, first generation, and these individuals are going to be are not only our lawyers, they're going to be our judges, they're going to be on the appellate division, they're going to be on the Supreme Court, and I can see it. I see a bright future. But every student, or at least they admit it to me, they won't say anything, believe in an independent judiciary. They also believe in a, uh, I see our judiciary is always growing, always reevaluating itself. Just on the bail issue, we reevaluated ourselves. On looking at rules, because the goal is access to justice. So I see a bright future for our judiciary. I see a strong judiciary. And when it's being challenged, that's one thing that I'm very proud about, the state of California, because I've had the opportunity to lecture throughout the country. And we have a very strong and united and supported judiciary. So I see a bright future, and I'm so proud to be a part of it. I'm so proud to be a part where we need to change to improve because the bottom line is called access to justice. Yes. This completes the list of witnesses who are here to testify. I think the members of the commission are ready to vote. All in favor of confirming Judge Terry Jackson for this position, please say aye. 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 On this record and the correspondence received, the commission finds the Honorable Terry L. Jackson qualified to be an Associate Justice of the Court of Appeal, First Appellate District, Division Three, and we confirm your appointment. Congratulations, Thank Justice you. Jackson. Ladies and gentlemen, please take a seat. I ask for your indulgence. We will be inviting Justice Jackson and her family back to the robing room to sign very important papers for the Secretary of State to commemorate and officialize. You don't want the whole family, do you? Because <laughs> you will get to invite who you want into the robing room. And then afterward, we'll come back out to administer the oath of office. OK, so I'll bring my recess. sister. <laughs>
Come on, you want to move in? You could all stand in front of you and be seen. Come on. <laughs> Yes, you come in? Can we see everyone? Again? Okay. <laughs> you could probably... <laughs> Feel free to bring your cameras, come into the well to take a picture if you wish. Raise your right hand, repeat after me. I, state your name. I, Terry L. Jackson. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. That I will support and defend. That I will support and defend. The Constitution of the United States. The Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution of the State of California. And the Constitution of the State of California. Against all enemies. Against all enemies. Foreign and domestic. Foreign and domestic. That I will bear true faith and allegiance. That I will bear true faith and allegiance. To the Constitution of the United States. To the Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution of the State of California. And the Constitution of the State of California. That I take this obligation freely. That I take this obligation freely. Without any mental reservation. Without any mental reservation. Or purpose of evasion. Or purpose of evasion. And that I will well and faithfully. That I will well and faithfully discharge the duties. Discharge the duties upon which I'm about to enter. Upon which I'm about to enter. Thank you. First and foremost, please be seated. And I'm going to have to keep it short because I have family standing behind me, but I want to thank the governor and the governor's administration. I also wish to thank the justice whose seat I'm about to enter, and that's Justice Martin Jenkins. going to be a tremendous responsibility upon me to fulfill his seat and all the things that he has accomplished, but I will try my best, and I want to assure you that he will call me when I fail. <laughs> I want to thank the speakers, and starting with Kelvin, or Judge Filer. In, you didn't have to say the year, but 1973, I was 15, 16, and Kelvin took it upon himself to be my big brother but I will never forget the first day we were at UC Santa Cruz. His father and mother drove him up. My parents drove me down from Dealey City, Kelvin from Compton. His father, just to give you a little history, carried the California flag on the March on Washington with Dr. Martin Luther King. My father was an advocate at the Rincon Annex Post Office for all those who were of color, particularly African-Americans who would get in trouble. So you had these two very powerful men driving up to UC Santa Cruz, looking at each other and saying, could they not have picked a better UC system? <laughs> that was cool. Because at that time, UC Santa Cruz was known for its banana slugs. In fact, that's our mascot. And it had cows. So a girl from Daly City and a young man from Compton. And we clung and hung on to each other. We took classes together. We had our ups, we had our downs. We filled out our law school applications. And we re remain to this day brother and sister, and Kelvin, I want to thank you so much. And you are just, and he is our poet, <laughs> as you could tell. Judge Lee, you're right. We worked at the San Francisco DA's office. You and Chloe Hewlett were the first women of color who were supervisors, and I was in awe. Particularly, not to say I wasn't in awe of Chloe, but... Judge Lee was taking on criminal, um, handling career criminal cases, and she would walk to court with a tenacity that she took no prisoners, and she was the most ethical person I've ever seen, and to do her job quite well. I was so privileged to follow her onto the bench, and there she was, as she said, the presiding judge. She led our court, as well as many other presiding judges, and I can name them and forgive me, Catherine Feinstein, John Stewart, and Donna Hitchens, but Judge Lee because of our friendship. And when I became the assistant presiding judge and presiding judge, there she was to mentor, to guide, and always to say, I don't know about this tea. 
I think you need to go in a different direction. I hope you will continue to be that way with me. Oh, Justice Wiseman, what can I say? I love you. You were my, you know, when we, I talked about drum major, cheerleader, you were all those things in cattle prodder and just told me to do it. And when I would come back, you would say, that was fine. This is how you're going to handle it. And I remember meeting you for the first time when she visited our court to tell us how to build a great appellate record. And um, it was wonderful. And I'm so thankful and fortunate to have you in my life. Yolanda, I didn't know I swore you in in 1995. You know, I always had this um, term, well, when my students start to appear before me, maybe it's time to move on. <laughs> No, we have become such good friends. We have we've had some challenging issues with the bar. We've agreed on many things and disagreed, but we will always and have been a part of um, our friendship. And I will continue to work with the bar. And the Jenny, what can I say about the Jenny? That's a lot of work. And when I was doing my interview, I don't know if they told you, they were done. And I said, but I have some more to talk about. <laughs> Finally, one of the um, interviewers said, I have a deposition I have to do, get ready for. <laughs> so um, I, I really appreciate the hard work. I mean, they have their day jobs. And then to read our applications and, and to go over the cases and to talk to people, uh, this is a very good vetting process. And I'm so glad I went, well, now I can say I'm glad I went through it. What can I say? I look back on my life in my career, and what people who cannot be here are my parents. I wish you could have met them. B and um, Jack, but my sister, Portia, she embodies them. She has their spirit, their confidence. She has their, um, I don't know, just, I'm gonna do it, I'm gonna take care of Terry. And that was how my parents were when they were alive. And my sister, Portia, who I have to say in this room is my best friend. My brother-in-law, I don't know why when you met, met me, I was a, at that time I was 17 years old, I was in a sophomore in college, and you know when you just get a little bit of something in class, you think that you know everything. And there my father and I were having a heated discussion. I was, I don't know, being a brat. And um, Paul sat there, and he was meeting the family for the first time. I don't know why he didn't run, but he stayed. And you know, often I introduce them as my sister and brother. And people are thinking, okay, my brother-in-law, because I grew up with Paul. At age 17, I met him. He married my sister. And thank God, because they then had my heart and my love and my life. And that's Jason and Jaren, my babies. And I know they're mine. <laughs> Jaren's here with his wife, Elsa. And they have three beautiful children. If I could just tell just a little bit of story about Jason and Jaren, I always wanted them to be lawyers. I saw the movie To Kill a Mockingbird, so at age Four, I had them watch the movie. And they called their mother and said, Auntie is making us watch a sad movie. <laughs> I took them, when they would come to visit, I would take them to court. I would debrief them, what did you see in court? What did you hear? And they would say, you would always seem that Auntie argued with the judge. And then they would go back to their school back in Southern California. And unbeknownst to me, they were very proud of me. And they knew I was a prosecutor or they knew I did something with the P, and they couldn't remember quite prosecutor. So they went, yeah, I'll tell the story. <laughs> they went back and told all their little soccer buddies that my auntie is the most powerful prostitute. In <laughs> <laughs> so when I went down to visit, I noticed that those soccer fathers were the most genuine, nicest guys in the world. <laughs> Only to find out that 
Jason and Jaren didn't quite understand prosecutor, but they went on to college, thank God. And they now, and I just want you to repeat after me, I'm an associate justice, okay? <laughs> <laughs> that's a good joke. That, that, oh, I just was told it's a good joke. It's a story. <laughs> a story. But anyway, um, yes, they are my, I, I have to say they're my existence for doing what I'm doing. And I hope not only, you know, when we talk about being role models, I, I didn't set out to be a role model to them. I just want them to do the right thing. And I hope they picked up those values. If they see something that's wrong, I hope they have the courage to speak out. If they see something needs to be changed, then make that change. And that's the only thing I can say to them. Also present on the podium, my uncle and aunt from Louisiana, Modi. <laughs> <laughs> my brother's youngest, uh, my mom's youngest brother, one of the youngest, and they are here, and I just can't thank them enough. So, what can I say? I'm gonna end this, because I know this has been a long proceeding. Um, Someone once asked me if I had a favorite um, Bible verse or saying, and I have this song that I grew up with in church, and it's been my motto, and I use it. In fact, it's on my desk, and if there's ever a time where I doubt myself, ever a time where I feel that maybe I, I don't quite get it, and lose sight of the goal is to do your best, make your decisions based upon the facts and the law, and try to be fair. I use this to get me through, and it's going to continue to be my motto. It says, I don't feel no ways tired. I come too far from where I started from. No one told me that this road is going to be easy, but I don't believe you brought me this far to leave me. Thank you. Thank you.